All right, so here we are. I've got my telescope set up outside. It's got a camera in the focuser and the telescope's on a motorized mount. It's all connected to a computer. And right now I'm kind of remote desktop into that computer as if I'm out there. So this camera assisted observing telescope is pretty fun. Uh, let me zoom out here. So right now what we see is actually the live feed from the camera that's in the telescope. So these are just two second exposures. And uh, you can see the stars. But right now we're looking at a comet. It's very, very faint, just barely right there. And we can look at, uh, I also have a second camera on here that's sort of a wide field because I'm operating remote and the telescope's out there. It's handy to have this one so I can check up and see if it's you know pointing into a tree or if clouds are going by. So uh, I also have this planetarium which is telling us where the telescope is pointing. So this is essentially like a big sky map. It has all the constellations, the stars, all the interesting objects. And this border represents the two cameras. The big rectangle, oh, you see that streak? That might have been a shooting star. It was pretty fast for a satellite. Usually satellites, you know, make it part way across and each frame you kind of see an inchworm across the picture. But that was streaked across the whole thing. Which means it was booking it. So uh, right now the, the telescope's pointing at a comet C 2019U6. And if we go back to the camera feed, you can see the, these are the, the two second exposures. It's pretty gritty, noisy, and grainy. That's because I have it kind of boosted in this corner. So uh, if I cancel the boost, these are showing the individual frames coming from the camera. And we can increase the exposure to maybe eight seconds. And then down in the bottom right corner, there's that little progress bar shows you know how far along each exposure is and it displays it immediately when it's done and this right here is a histogram and anyone unfamiliar with it it's it basically represents all the information that's captured by the sensor and since this is a pretty dark sky well actually I should go into that the left side represents black zero signal the right side represents white fully saturated overblown exposed and the middle is just sort of 50% gray. And the really powerful thing with the histogram is you can actually remap it. So instead of having gray half brightness be in the middle, you can push it closer to the, the black value. And that'll really accentuate all the very dark tones and dark grays in the sky. And the other useful tool is the, the black level. You can bring this in and try and kind of clip the sky brightness because you can remap that brightness to be zero and then you can play with those two values to kind of accentuate what you're trying to see and I don't know if you can see on stream but there's a very faint little smudge right there it's just barely visible and that's about as good as the eight second exposures will show it to us but there's another powerful tool is uh, live stacking. So this, this software will actually accumulate all these individual frames one after another live on the fly and it actually as it receives the new frames it will align and average and that way you know I, the, my telescope doesn't track perfectly and as the stars kind of drift around the pictures it counteracts that and it keeps the picture nice and sharp and it makes it a lot more approachable to use so we'll start a live stack now. I'm going to clear out the old one, and we should start to see stuff accumulate. The first frame is going to look pretty ugly, just because it's a single picture, and it's very noisy. But you can see that there's just something right there. And as we accumulate more frames, so now we've got two pictures averaged together, a total of 16 seconds. And you'll see this counter continue to go up as we accumulate more exposures and the, the exposure processes down here. So as we 
accumulate more data, it gets smoother, and that lets us be a little more aggressive with how we stretch the histogram, how, we, how far we can clip the black point, and how much we can push the gray point to accentuate the object. So hopefully it's a little easier to see that, that fuzzy patch right there. Maybe I'll zoom in, it might be a little better. It's still very, very noisy because we've only got you know, about a minute's worth of data. And this is a very faint, diffuse object. And if we look at the wide field camera, it's pretty low on the horizon. So the, the telescope is looking through a lot of air. So it kind of gets a little murky. As we start looking at stuff that's closer to overhead, it, it should be a little clearer. And brighter objects are usually a lot better. But we can definitely see that something's there. There's a little bright nucleus, and then just sort of a faint, diffuse glow of the com comet. So I'm actually going to back off of the stretch just because I think it's a, a little much. There's C2019 U6, I think Lemon was the name of it. So the other neat thing is uh, you can just save snapshots exactly how you see them. So this will save it to a folder, and then maybe in 30 minutes to an hour, we'll come back and try and see if we can find the comet again. And then we could compare the two pictures back and forth and see if we see any motion of the comet. That would be pretty cool. I think it should only take about 30 minutes to an hour for there to be enough motion to notice. So I saved a snapshot. I'm going to take it back down to two seconds and stretch the two seconds just to make it a little more apparent. And now we can select a new target and slew over to it. So. I would really like to see, uh, I don't know if these will be in the tree, but there's some fantastic galaxies near the Big Dipper's handle, M51. Looks like that's going to be in the tree, so maybe I won't talk it up too much because <laughs> they're not going to be able to look at it. That's too bad. So maybe about a month ago, it would be sort of more west in the sky, we'd be able to see it. Or if I were at a, a flat a field with a better horizon. So we'll try it a, diff a different galaxy that's a little higher up, M101, but looks like that one's also going to be in the tree. How about this? Tried to pick a, a bunch of objects just to have a choice, because I know I've got some pretty bad horizons, a lot of trees around me. Not sure if this one will be above the tree or not. Might be worth a shot. Maybe. maybe. Oh, that's close. We'll give it a shot. We'll probably have maybe 10 or 15 minutes on this one before it goes into the tree. But this object, you can see it's a lot more apparent. So this is looks like an edge-on spiral galaxy. So it's really a, a flat disk, but we happen to be looking at it from the side. So all we see is kind of a straight line. And these are just the, the raw two-second exposures that have been a, a little bit boosted from the camera. So we've got a bit of a display stretch on there. I saw a question of uh, where am I? I'm in Maynard, Massachusetts. It's kind of halfway between Boston and Worcester. It's kind of the local minimum of light pollution. I think on the light pollution maps, they estimate about Portal 5. So certainly better than downtown Boston, but not as nice as upstate New Hampshire. But with the camera, it helps a lot. You can punch through the light pollution a little bit. So right now, this is just two-second exposures. I want to get the number of this object before I forget it. So this was NGC 5906. 
And I'm just going to type it up here, GC5906, just that name gets attached to the file when I save it, just so I don't get confused when I look at them the next morning. So I'm going to bump up the exposure to 8 seconds, and I'm going to stop stretching those frames, and I'm going to start live stacking. The old live stack is still in memory. Here's that comment still. So we need to clear that out. And now it'll restart and it'll start accumulating frames on the new object. And I've got to kind of adjust the histogram to match this one. And you can also color balance. The sky looks maybe a little bit blue, so I can decrease the blue here. But in pretty short order, you can see it, the image cleans up pretty quickly. So in only four exposures, 30 seconds, you can already see a little bit of a dust lane sort of going down that, because we're looking at it on edge. When you look at the galaxy's face on, you see the sort of the beautiful spiral structures. All the, the dark areas are just all sorts of gas and dust, sort of slightly opaque. So when you're looking at it from the edge, all that opaque stuff kind of stacks up on on itself and you get a really high contrast super thin line just cutting through i really like edge on galaxies this is you know kind of closer to our view of our milky way this is kind of what we see in the summertime except we're in there and it wraps all the way around us so this is what it looks like from the outside so I can probably clip the sky a little more, reduce the midpoint just to kind of ease up on it because the sky was looking pretty gnarly there, a lot of sort of confetti colors. So th this is a color camera, so it has a, a Bayer filter. So you know, groups of four pixels, there's two greens, one red, one blue and it just gets all the color information in one shot at the expense of some resolution. And when you're operating at these extreme low light situations, the, the noise is very colorful. So sometimes I back off the stretch initially, just because if you push too hard too soon, it, it can look pretty rough. But sometimes you can use that as an you know, observational tool, like if you wanted to see the full extent of how far that reaches, and you're not necessarily concerned with how nice the center looks or how nice the sky looks, you can crank it to your heart's desire. Yeah, it looks pretty rough, but you can really see the sort of full extent of it. And if you were to let this run for, say, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, it actually clean up pretty nice. But I usually prefer sort of more subtle, natural processing. I like to have a little bit of sky glow. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the, the mount that I'm using, it's actually a bit of a story. It's a uh, it's an old Vixen Super Polaris. I think it was from the 1980s. I got it used at Stellophane at the swap table for really cheap. I'll see if I can pull up a picture of it. But uh, I just got the mount head, and it had a an ancient uh, go-to system, really old stepper motors with a very archaic drive system that had a pendant. And when you wanted to go to an object, you had to open the manual, go to the back index, look up the odd object, read a, uh, a register number, and then punch in the register number into the thing. And it would, I, I've read that it slewed at like, I don't know, half a degree per second or some, some really slow, crazy slow speed. But uh, the mechanics of the mount was great. So I put a new motion control system on there. There's a really great uh, open source project called OnStep. You just buy, basically you piggyback off of 3D printing 
commodity items. So because of 3D printing, a lot of motion control stuff has become dirt cheap. So you can buy really high quality stepper motors, timing belts, pulleys, even like 3D printer motherboard control boards and printer drivers all for maybe less than 200 bucks total flash. Instead of flashing a 3D printer control software, you flash a telescope control because the, the circuit board serves the same function, you know, coordinated precise movement of motors. So it's all there. So this one guy in Texas provides a software where you just load a telescope control on there, strap the motors to your mount, and it turns anything into a go-to mount. You can connect Bluetooth. Like right now, the, the mount's connected to my computer over Bluetooth. There's my little computer that I'm controlling it on, or I'm, I'm remote desktoped into this little computer. And on the back side, you can't see it, but there's a little Wi-Fi router that has a high-gain antenna. And I've got another high-gain antenna on this computer, and they're kind of pointed at each other. So I get pretty good long-range reception. But uh, in short, the, the mount's a Super Polaris, but it has modern control on it. And the Super Polaris is only rated for about 15 pounds of telescope. But the 8-inch Newtonian is about 25 pounds with the camera. But fortunately, this live stacking process is super forgiving because you're only taking teeny tiny, you know, four second or eight second exposures. Even, you know, the worst mount will have acceptable stars at those tiny snapshots. And because the, the software does the long term alignment for you, you can kind of get away with it and still accumulate these long exposures. Like we've been looking at this one for about six minutes and it's definitely cleared up a bunch and I can probably be a little more aggressive with a stretch to try to darken the sky a little and try to boost boost the galaxy and now you can start to see not only the dust lane but that it's kind of mottled and has some texture because it's you know just a aggregate of a bunch of clouds of gas and dust it's not a smooth uniform thing and you can tell that it's we're not absolutely directly on plane. We're a little bit to one side. On some galaxies, we're actually like perfectly right down the middle on plane. And the black stripe or the dark stripe is really, really sort of perfectly thin and narrow right down the middle. It's really cool. If we were to stay until maybe two or three in the morning, there's a NGC 981 or 891 in Andromeda, I think. That's like that. It's it's a really nice looking galaxy. But in in pretty short time you can see you can pull out a lot of detail and stuff like this. It's a lot of fun. I see someone in the comments has the AVX, a C six and a two two four. That uh, should be a pretty great combo too. I think the AVX is a much more capable mount than the one I'm using. And the 224 is a really nice camera, especially when paired with a, a smaller telescope. Because it, it has a pretty small chip, which gives it a pretty small field of view. But when you use small scope with it, it's all perfectly paired. So there's a lot of glow there. I'm just going to check uh, wide field first. That would explain it. Where I Remember I said we only had about 10 minutes before this is in the tree? It looks like we're in the tree, so this will just slowly creep over the whole thing. All right, so let's check the planetarium, see what else is out there. So if I zoom way out. So this is kind of a funky view. It's a little warped and distorted. So this is in equatorial coordinates. So instead of kind of the intuitive feet on the ground, left, right, up, down. This is as if we're standing at the North Pole and our head is aligned to the celestial pole, the axis of rotation of Earth. So if you imagine that this line is the horizon and this line is the meridian, which kind of divides the sky in two. There's everything sort of the east side of the sky and the west side of the sky. And this, this would be the theoretical horizon if we were on like a salt flat or an ocean. But because I'm surrounded by trees, the real horizon is much higher. So I don't think we'll be able to look at 
anything below. Actually, let's go back to that comment just to make sure we catch it before it goes into the trees. It's been maybe 10, 15 minutes. Let's give it a shot. And we'll check the wide field, make sure. As so Mario was saying, he had a, a one hour exposure of that galaxy. Mario has a, this is an eight inch telescope. Mario has a 32 inch telescope, so that must have been a phenomenal picture. Because it, the, the software is fun and the, the cameras are very powerful, but you can't cheat physics, aperture, aperture rules. So. so it looks like we're still in the open. In a little bit, we'll probably hit this power line, which should be okay. We'll just get an, a little extra diffraction spike. So I'm going to clear this, end the live stack. And this isn't strictly necessary, but I like to do it. I like to go back down. Oh, there's a satellite. So that looks like there might be some clouds. I didn't see it on wide field. That looks like just one little puff of clouds right there. So that should pass pretty quickly. So now we're back to where the comet should be. I remember it was pretty faint at two seconds, so we'll go straight to eight seconds. And I'm going to update the name here so I don't forget. U6. And I think I can just about see it right there. I'm going to go straight into the live stack, clear out the old one. And at least with Sharp Cap, it's a little funny. It has two histograms. So if you're not careful, you can end up stretching the same image twice and it gets out of hand really fast. So I can just barely make it out there, but uh, it'll be better once I fix the histogram. And there, there's uh, automatic buttons. So as you're learning, you can hit the little lightning bolt and it'll kind of give its best guess at stretching. It'll get you close and then you can just sort of play. And all, all of these adjustments, it's all kind of by look and by feel and to taste. There's no, I don't, at least I don't think there's a, absolute best way of doing it. And there's a lot of preference in it. Uh, like a lot of times I'll use the, the automatic color balance and that'll get me pretty close. So you can definitely see the comment there. So we're stacking away. I'm gonna go to the folder where that was saved and see if I can open it and just do sort of a, a poor man's Link comparison between the two. See if we can see any motion on that comet. So that would be sharp cap today's date. I think we can see a little bit of mo oh, there's a satellite and a half. Let's see if we can catch it on the wide field. I'm not seeing it. Might be too faint for the tiny little camera, but with this eight inch, it'll pick up pretty faint stuff. All right, so back to the photo. So here is the one that we took maybe 10 minutes ago. Now, what we were looking at, or we should look at are this bright star, the comet, and that dim star right there. And you can see in this picture, they're almost in a line. But in the new one that we're looking at, that comet has moved horizontally to the left. It's no longer in between those two. So in just the short matter of, I think, 15 minutes that was between these two pictures, you can see that motion of the comet, which is pretty cool. And in SharpCap, there's a setting I like to use where you can tell it to automatically save the live stack every specified amount of minutes. So you can actually end up making a time lapse. So you get, you know, a three minute live stack. You get a new one every three minutes and then the next day you can string it together into a video and play it. And you'd actually see smooth movement of the comet, which is pretty cool.
but even with still images you can kind of blink back and forth and see that it's definitely moved. So it was here and now it's shifted over a little bit. So Mario is asking if you can drop some of the stack if you have a problem. Like for example, this uh, the satellite is a problem. You know, it's it's going to be baked in there. So unfortunately, you can't. That's that's kind of what you give up when you play around with live stacking. So you, you give up the the power and flexibility of the conventional astrophotography post processing workflow, and you trade that for kind of immediate gratification and sort of immediate gain. Um, there is, in the ASI studio, there's a really cool feature where you can reject the last frame. So as soon as I saw that comet or that satellite, if I was in the other program, there's a button that looks like a broom and you can disregard the previous frame, which is handy. Sharp cap doesn't do it. It does have uh, Sigma clipping stacking though, which can be useful, which will kind of get rid of that one. So it'll basically, I think the conventional process is you have all of your pictures ready to go and you run it through Sigma clipping and it finds an average value for every pixel. And if any pixel is too far from that average, it ignores it. So for example, a plane or a satellite streaking across and it, it, it works really well. The only problem for live stacking is you don't have your full data set to begin with and you know you're you're running a living live average. So the one sort of gotcha with doing sigma clipping live stacking is you need uh you basically you set up an initial count. So you tell it to average the first 5 frames and that builds your your average that you're going to evaluate from. And if any new frame on top of that five frames deviates too much, then it'll it'll do the correct sigma clipping and reject only the bright pixels. And the only trouble is during those five frames, you're vulnerable. If something comes in, it'll wreak havoc on the average. So it's it's not perfect. Yeah, and as Gary said, I, I could just restart the stack. I'm not too invested in it at five minutes. And for this comment, mostly I'm, I'm looking for the position, just to see the position change. And in the, the f almost six minutes, you can start to see the comment is actually beginning to elongate because the, the alignment of the live stack is based off the stars and the comet's moving across the stars. So it'll, it'll eventually smear out a few stack it for too long. But it's actually been stacking long enough that I could definitely push the histogram a little farther, which should show us the comet. Still got that border here. I wonder if we're approaching that wire. Yeah, we're on the wire. So that wire is catching enough light to mess with things. But if you look at the uh, star image, if actually, I'll, I'll exit the live stack. It'll probably be more apparent. I bet we'll end up with an extra diffraction spike. So the Newtonian has the four veins, but if we're looking through a wire, there should be a third spike. That's pretty, it's pretty extreme. Yeah. Maybe not. Maybe no bright stars. Another satellite. And this is just a raw eight second exposure coming from the camera. Oh. Right, let's check out the planetarium and see if we can find something well positioned. So all of this stuff is behind the trees, but M13 should be pretty well placed overhead. So this is a fantastic globular cluster in Hercules. And I'll decrease the exposure down to two seconds. 
just to make it a little more live. I like to see the Mount Slew, it's kind of fun. So right now we're, we're just looking at two second exposures straight from the camera, no, no live stacking, which is pretty fun. So for the brighter objects, you can just about use it as a direct observational tool, which is pretty fun. And then with the, the gray point in the histogram, you can you know, choose to accentuate, accentuate the very faint members or to kind of look at only the brightest members. Ignore the colors, it's, it's just the Bayer filter. Being kind of weird, but this is pretty fun for using. Uh, I eventually, I'd like to use it for outreach. Maybe bin the camera and just have the the immediate live view. It might help people connect with it more. And the the ASI Live is probably a better software. It has a much more streamlined user interface without all the sort of scary menus off to one side that might distract someone just just wants to see this stuff and it has sort of like tablet style buttons along the side which could be use, useful I, I run a tablet for outreach so we'll rename this m13 so i'm gonna maybe only boost it to four seconds or else I might blow out a lot of those stars. Not a hundred percent sure. Yeah, I'll keep it at four seconds. And because I'm changing my exposure, I'll I'll want to match my dark frame. Just want to pick the right date. There's the one. So let's start live stacking this. And again, we have the old one still in memory, so we just have to clear that out. And the new one should load in. So right now it's just a single four second exposure. Pretty noisy, pretty ugly, but it very quickly cleans up. You can start to see uh, some color variation in the stars. I really like having the color. The, the a mono camera, which has just all black and white pixels, it's fantastic for resolution because all pixels kind of respond the same. But the color camera is pretty fun for EAA just because you you get to see in one instant color. You know the individual frames are colored. You see all the color in the nebula, so it's kind of a trade-off between speed and resolution of mono unfiltered or the color for my smaller sensors i have a, a color sensor and a mono camera and the mono one is fantastic on galaxies especially the teeny tiny faint distance distant ones because they're all essentially monochrome anyway there's not a ton of value to color but you can see that there's some kind of a mix of they look kind of orange because my colors are kind of messed up, but there's blue and yellow stars all throughout the globular cluster. I think the term for the blue ones is blue stragglers, and I'm not too knowledgeable on the theory and stellar evolution, but they're two different types of stars, two different kind of ages and lineages. I'm not sure. Wikipedia would inform me. It's a lot of fun. It's always cool to see stuff and go, what the heck is that? And then you end up learning about it. Sort of. I'm going to try and get the, the white balance a little better. So the way I usually do it is I, I kind of go off the sky color. And that kind of looks maybe a little bit red. So down here, I'll just click and now it looks a little bit green. Just sort of push stuff around. I'm sure there's in the conventional post processing workflow, there's, there's probably some very good methods. But for sharp cap and sort of the fast and quick EAA, this is pretty good enough. I'm 
know, tone it down a little bit just because if I, with this, especially now that we're live stacking, you can see if you really, really boost the, the gray point, you can, you get to see a lot of the faintest members sort of out at the edge, but you really lose a lot of detail in the middle. So I, I like to kind of back it off and go somewhere in between. And then to the extreme, if you go all the way to the other side, you can really accentuate just the brightest members. So these would be some of the first stars that you'd see visually as you increase magnification or aperture. So the, Gary's asking about the field of view, and I, I think that's about right. It's 1.3 by 1 <coughs> degree. So it's pretty nice. I, I like it a lot. Previously, it used to be, I think, half a degree by a third a degree, and that was pretty tight, especially when I was doing my initial alignment. So most deep space objects will only occupy a tiny fraction of the field of view, but it's still pretty useful to have it and not need it and need it and not have it. So like, for example, we can see, you know, a background galaxy all the way over here. Whereas if we were in a, a tighter crop view, we wouldn't, we wouldn't get that. I mean, we, we could still see the galaxy, but we'd have to shift the telescope over and just view it. Oh yeah, Bob Toop saying he can see the propeller forming, and we can actually probably play with the, uh, the gray point to try and help accentuate it. So if you look a little off center, you can see kind of a, a distinct lack of stars that happens to form like a perfect little airplane propeller, and you can you can see that visually in a telescope too. Mario is saying you can you can always post process, which is true. The, there's a setting here. So right now the way I, I have it running is I'm I'm throwing away all my data. It's only load it's only used in RAM to form the image on screen. And if I don't save a snapshot, it's just gone forever. There is an option where you can save all the individual sub exposures. So if you do want to experiment with a, a traditional workflow you can have kind of the best of both worlds. You can have this live interactive experience, but also have all the data saved away that you can play with later. The only downside is for, for live stacking, I use very short exposures. And I think this camera's raw frames are about 25 megabytes each. So it adds up pretty quickly. It's already been a hundred frames. So if, if you, did intend to post process later, you'd probably be better to err on the longer side of exposures. But then you need a, a good enough mount so that you don't smear the stars in that exposure and maybe auto guiding would help too. That's the other thing, I have no auto guiding for this. It's just really, really cheap and easy. Very forgiving. All right, I'm gonna check the south. I have a very narrow window in the trees where I can see some of the southern objects. And that's, unfortunately, that's a, where a lot of the really, really nice stuff is. So let's make a mad dash for it and I'll check the wide field. Oh, don't need that much zoom. So I've got a lot of trees all around me but to the south, there's this one little notch. And it looks like it might be a little cloudy down there, but it looks like we're in the notch, which is good. So we'll give it a shot. Looks a little murky, but 
what the heck let's try so I don't remember if I saved a snapshot of M13 so I'll do that now and now I'm gonna exit to live stack we'll be looking at the the frames coming right off the camera and it, uh, maybe we'll find a different object this would be the Eagle Nebula but there's some leaves on a tree right there and my neighbor's got a floodlight in his backyard that he always leaves on but down there looks good actually the uh, <coughs> swan or omega might be good There, yeah, so we've got a little bit of cloud coming and going, but we'll give it a shot anyway. Let's take a look. So these are the... Well, that's pretty ugly. Wrong one. So you can definitely see the swan shape in there, up, sort of upside down right now. So it's perfect little head, neck, and body, as if it were floating in water. This is good, probably going to be pretty rough with the clouds in there, but we'll give it a shot. Sometimes the camera can punch through. So I'm at eight second exposures. I want to make sure to match my dark frame. So before I started, actually yesterday, I took a some dark frames to match all the different exposure lengths that I'd plan to use. I usually just do two second, four second, and eight second. So let's choose the right dark frame, clear out the old stack, make sure I've got the label. And now we should start accumulating frames. Now this will be pretty tricky to stay on top of because this this histogram is going to move all over the place as the clouds kind of come and go, and then you can already see the color is pretty wacky. But we can try our best, give it a best effort. You know, as as far as a a picture for astrophotography, it it wouldn't win any awards, but as an observational tool, it's fantastic. You know, if you were to if you were to try and look at this visually in these conditions you know if we switch back to show the uh, individual frames unstretched it's just kind of murky murky gray soup so I switch back to the live stack decent sky looks a little blue I'll turn that down the sky color will probably wander as clouds come and go. So we can t start to see some of the faint sort of billowy hydrogen alpha out there. Decent sort of resolution on the dark splotches. So the Gary's asking about filters and right now this is wide open. It's just the Bayer filter. A couple times I've tried a, a UHC filter, and I still kind of mixed results on it. I'm not a hundred percent sure how much it helped. the The only downside is you need to bump up the exposure to match the loss in light, which brings me closer to the limit of my mount. I have pretty good chances of getting sixteen second exposures. Thirty two seconds there is a probably less than 50% success for me. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. The UHC should give good contrast, but it, my mount's not up to the task.
Mario is asking for clarification on the save files. So there's a bunch of options here, but the, the one that I use is it just saves the actual picture that's displayed with the histogram stretches applied. There are other options where you can save a 16-bit and 32-bit fits file, and that, that one's a lot more pliable for post-processing. But for me, I, I end up, I don't usually post-process, I just leave them as they are. So this is good enough for my purposes, the, the amount of tweaking that can be done with just this little histogram. It's not perfect, but it's, it's quick and easy, sort of 80-20 principle. 80% of the effort for, or 20% uh, effort for 80% result. So if I go to the folder where this is all, where this is saving to, it's just some simple PNGs in there that are, can be opened with any program. It can be zoomed in, and they've got the, the color balance and the histogram stretch applied. There are some enhancements that you can play with. You can do noise reduction and sharpening, but usually I only use that on like very critical objects or threshold observation where it's just really, really close to noise. I'm starting to see some fainter patches out there. This guy's looking a little green. I'll reduce that. I think I'll save it there. Got to move pretty quick because uh, the notch in the trees is a pretty short window and there's a lot to see in there. So let's see if the uh, eagle is clear of that tree. And for this one, my mount has been doing pretty well with the go-tos. So I'm, I'm not even going to view the live frames. I'll just clear the stack and see if it landed close to center. Good enough. So we're still at eight second exposures. Dark frames are correctly selected. So we can just get straight into live stacking and sort of adjusting the histogram. I think we still have some clouds, yeah, coming and going. Looks like some pretty thick ones coming in. There's a feature that I don't often use where you can uh, you can filter what frames get added to the stack. So earlier I, I said there's the sigma clipping, which affects how things get stacked. But you can also filter on the is it full width half mean the star sharpness. So if it's a windy day and the mount's kind of jiggling around every now and then, you can automatically detect the frames with a lot of vibration and ignore those. They won't get added. And you can also add a filter for brightness. So here you can see a plot. And it's just, I don't know the units or the, the scaling on this, but you can set it up so that if a passing cloud came over, it would halt the stack until the brightness comes back down to normal and it re automatically resume. So you can see right here it's saying last five frames were not stacked. You can switch over to look at the individual frames and it's just a wall of gray, no stars. So it needs it needs to see and detect stars to be able to stack. Unless you turn alignment off, but then you would need auto guiding to make sure that the frames without any alignment all perfectly land on top of each other. I don't have that. So let's see if we can find something maybe overhead. Let's try a planetary nebula. 
nebylo. NGC 6781. I wish uh, Cart to Seal had the sort of common names. I'm terrible with the numbers. Let's check the wide field. Still some patchy clouds coming in. They're probably. Oh, yeah, we could definitely see it there. So we're still on eight seconds. So I'm going to clear the live stack. Go right into the stack and adjust the histogram. See what we can pull out on this. Looks pretty circular. Got a satellite going for it already. It's only two frames old. But uh, this picture isn't going to be beautiful anyway. There'll be some clouds rolling in any second. We can definitely see a sort of red border and a blue green center. I think hydrogen alpha and oxygen three, maybe. I bet uh, in the thirty two inch the image scale that you could get on this would be phenomenal, especially some of the planetaries are just, in my scope, it's just like a, a 30 pixel teeny tiny smudge. I've got the, the crescent on the list. I definitely want to check it out tonight. But I, I might hang on this side of the meridian just for now, just to see if these clouds will pass and to see if I can get back into that southern corner. Hopefully this is just a small passing band. I didn't see it on the forecast. Let's check the wide feed. Yeah, it looks like it's just passing by. So I'm actually going to clear this stack. See if we can ignore most of that cloud brightness. Maybe the central star there. You can see that one is looks physically central, but it's also very kind of pale blue. And you can see my color balance is kind of all over the place. I've got purple stars and blue green sky, so I might hit the auto button, see what it can do. That's pretty red, but it's closer. Check the wide field. Let's see if we can make it back down to Sagittarius. And I saw it was Gary was asking about the, this camera. So this camera is a uh, an IMX. 290 mono, so it's a really low read noise. I used to use it in my four and a half inch Newtonian, but uh, very low read noise, high sensitivity, so it makes a really nice E finder, or it would also make a decent guider. But I have a, a little C mount eight millimeter lens on there to give a wide field of view. It just helps me kind of reconnect with the telescope because I'm running it remotely and I. I can't see, you know, I don't have tabs on the clouds in here. Let's see. Uh, 
Let's start live stacking. Still eight seconds. Clear out the old one. See what we can get. Yeah, we're a little lower this time, but still reasonable. Looks like it's still pretty hazy. But for shooting through a bunch of murk, just murky, cloudy horizon like that, it's not doing too bad. You can just barely start to make out some shape down there, which would eventually become the eagle. It's a bummer, these clouds. I didn't see them forecast. See the open cluster there. Just starting to make out some shape on this. Usually it's it's a lot more immediate and crisp and clear, but the, the camera's putting up a fight through this cloud cover. Pretty blue. Like trying to hit a moving target, the colors are kind of drifting as the clouds come in and out. They usually have like a yellowish green cast to them, but not bad for two and a half minutes through some just kind of gray. I'll see if I can pull up a picture from last night. Uh, just for comparison. This was the, the finder view yesterday. So I was able to use a little longer exposure. That's why the trees are blown out. But you could, you could see all the stars and the lagoon and trifid and all that stuff. Whereas tonight, it's just kind of a, a sheet of gray murk. But it's putting up a fight. It's doing its best. And boost it a little bit. I think it's uh, time to abandon that part of the sky. Do it. Quick look at the ring nebula, and then I'll think about meridian flip soon. We'll go on the other side. I've been pretty lucky with my mount so far. It, it seems to do it fine unattended. I just have to be a little careful with my cable routing. Fortunately, that older mount is very smooth. There's not a lot of handles and knobs poking out all over the place. So for kicks, we'll go to the two-second live exposures, just to kind of give an idea of what it could be like at Outreach. That's a little much. It doesn't have to be that extreme.
but I, I think this could be fun for outreach to have this level of view to see it that clearly and with color I mean it'll it would be a, a little trickier in the city with more lights but I think it could still be fun central star there it's pretty noisy but we can always start a live stack and that noise should start to average out I'm gonna bump it up to eight seconds start the live stack turn off the double stretch I'll clear out the old one. I did. I did save that one, so I should have it. And you can see how different the histogram is down, or much higher in the sky. The valleys are a lot darker. Should be looking through less of the soup. Looks like it's pretty hazy out there. So this is more representative of the normal. EAA performance, where it's not fighting through clouds like that. And you can already see that there's a little faint hint of a little tiny background galaxy. Hopefully it'll clear up and become a little more present or apparent. But already you can see just... I, I really enjoy the color camera, even though, even though you, I do lose a lot of sensitivity and actual spatial resolution. But at least for this live stacking immediate EAA, it's nice to have color on these. And you can start to see little knots of hydrogen alpha kind of mixed into the oxygen center. And just a little bit of texture there. This is at kind of the threshold of the resolution. At this point, I'm just kind of empty zoom. You can see pixels. But you can play with the gray point and see if we can accentuate that inner texture at all. Maybe we'll boost it. This will kind of destroy the ring nebula. It'll make it look terrible, but we can try and boost it for just that little background galaxy. And it might be a little early to try. But, uh, when this one does show up, it has a pretty cool shape. It's like a perfect little propeller swoop, almost like a little S. That looks good enough for me. This is about where I like to have the sky, just sort of not pitch black, but very, very dark. But definitely some color there. Just going to check the wide field for cloud. See if we can get that little background galaxy. Just 
fairly. You can tell that it's kind of a barred spiral, but you don't see the the full extent of the shape. At least not yet. If you gave it 10, 10 or 15 minutes, it'd probably resolve pretty well. Or if the conditions were better with better transparency. Have a good night, Gary. I love having the, the super wide field just for surfing around. A lot of times you'll see just teeny, teeny, tiny little smudges in the background. And with the coma corrector, it, it does pretty well all the way out to the edges. It was really nice in uh, galactic clusters, like Virgo or Coma cluster. The, the field of view is just chock full of little yellow smudges. You can just pan around. By the, the time it takes me to pan around, you know, it's like five, ten minutes. And by that point, even more data is accumulated and it looks even better. So it's time to pan around again and you just get caught in a cycle. took a look at Rich Nugent's list of objects and I think this double star was on there. I was curious to see how the camera would do on it. I don't think it was a super tight double so there's at least a chance I can split it. So I'm going to save this picture of the ring, exit the live stack. So this is probably it. <laughs> and for this, I'll have to really decrease the exposure. Yeah, I don't think we're going to split it <laughs> if it is. Actually, I'm not even sure I'm looking at the right star. I should probably check the map. No, it should be just about the brightest one in the field. I've got a uh, cart. <coughs> Excuse me. I've got cart to seal loaded with uh, an extended. Deep Sky Catalog, so you can see at these zoom levels just the sheer number of background galaxies there are. It's like if you just point the camera anywhere, you're bound to capture at least a couple. Just looking for little previews to see if any of these are. texture or structure to them. But we could just let the camera run here and see how many of them we can pick up. Let's see. Eight seconds. We should be able to live stack. Gotta clear out the old ring live stack. So this version 
is the the latest from the site. Let me see, it's 3.2.6383. I think I just updated it last week or the week prior. Oh, and uh, I have the dark theme on. If you go to settings, you can display in a night mode. And oh, and, and on top of that, I have a custom Windows theme. So let me see. Uh, display night mode. If I like open my folder view, I, I went to the Windows settings. I turned on high contrast mode and you can configure the colors. You can choose what colors are used for what. So I have black as the background, red for text, yellow for hyperlinks. And, and those, that Windows configuration makes it into sharp cap too. So without that configuration, I think the, some of these boxes have white backgrounds and the text is pretty blinding, but with the custom high contrast, sort of astronomy friendly Windows theme, it, it works out pretty good. So we're just sort of looking at this field around the star. I just want to see if we'll pick up any of the small background galaxies. Looks like there should be a couple in this corner. Uh, magnitude 16 and 17. That might be pretty tight for this scope. And I'm not sure the, the uh, field actually makes it all the way out there because I'm not perfectly centered on that star. There's a pretty red one I think I saw on the chart. I think I can just about make out one of them. At at this point, they're they're usually extremely small, extremely faint, and fairly devoid of features, at least at my resolution. But it's still awesome to see them. A lot of times, if you can pull up the catalog number and get better information on them. They don't always have a distance, but the ones that do, they're usually pretty surprising. And no data. But easily, like, 300 million light years and further, which is like predating Pangaea coming together, or 420 million is around the time, supposedly. It's just nuts. All right, let's see if we can see how the sky is, see if the haze is still there. Maybe a little bit, but maybe it's time to flip. So my mount can go a little bit beyond the meridian. So when I flip, I'll actually sort of shoot for something that's well beyond and that'll 
make sure that the mount goes through a proper Meridian flip. I think before I do that, I want to check out M27, just because it's a, a really nice, big planetary, lots of detail, lots of color. Just because it's so close to the Meridian, I should be able to make it. There we go. Definitely landed on target. So these are the uh, just the raw eight second exposures rolling off the camera, and then I can apply a little bit of a histogram boost over here. Thanks for tuning in, Mario. So we'll uh, start live stacking on this one, clear up the old one. should start accumulating. He landed a little off center, but it's good enough. So right now it looks pretty ugly because I have both histogram stretches applied, so it's kind of like double boosted. So you can definitely see the central star and some kind of red modeling of the hydrogen alpha. We can see the the O3, the blue green is kind of bulging out at the seams. I don't know why, but in this latest version of SharpCap, they changed the behavior of the, the labeling. So now you need the correct label when you begin the stack and you can't change it halfway through, which is a problem for me because I always forget to change the label. So if I wanted this, if I wanted to save this and I wanted the file to have the correct name, I would have to reset the live stack and clear out all the information I had. It's kind of annoying. But you can see the, the uh, sort of modeled texture is starting to refine. I just love having the color. It's so fun. This sort of quickly. I think we'll hop to the uh, Crescent Nebula. We'll do a Meridian flip. Check it out. All right. I'm going to pick something that is very over the Meridian. And you'll see the mount will go up toward the pole and swing around. We can check the wide field and you should see the side of my house. Where the telescope is, it just clears the house to get a sight line onto Polaris for the German equatorial. And there's Polaris right there.
I'm hoping to build an alt azimuth mount uh, just to make the setup a little quicker because eventually I'd like to get this sort of quick and smooth enough to set up so that I could bring it to outreach and a lot of times at outreach they start the event at sort of at sundown and there's not a lot of time to get up and running and the sky's not very dark for doing a polar alignment. All right, so we're on the right side of the meridian, and we'll go straight for the crescent. For this, we should be able to go back onto the main camera. We'll zoom out, and I'll stretch the frames. The uh, automatic stretch here is a little extreme, but you can definitely see the crescent there. A shield shape. I'm gonna quickly adjust the setting in sharp cap to try and tone it down. Yeah, we go. That's more reasonable. And I'm terrible with the numbers, so six eight eight eight. NGC six eight eight. Here we'll start live stacking, clear out the old one. I'm still at two second exposure, so I want to be at eight second. And I'll clear out the accidental two second exposures. And again, I'm accidentally stretching it twice, so I'll disengage that one. Sky looks a little blue, so I'll reduce the amount of blue. And now we'll start stretching. Seems like the sky's cleared up a little bit as far as quick response and quickly building good data without so much sort of murky gray. Gray. You can see some slight variation in the color of the brighter stars. Is nice. Definitely have some bright, sort of saturated red hydrogen alpha areas. But it looks like there's some paler splotches that might have a little bit of reflection in there, too. Kind of right here, and it looks like maybe right there there's a kind of pale yellow spot. The, just reading through the comments here, Bob was saying the, that tiny little background galaxy beyond the Ring Nebula, IC1296, this is a hundred times as far as Andromeda, so 250 or 260,000 light or million light years. It's just nuts.
And with this being sort of along the Milky Way, you can just see how absolutely chock full of stars it is. It's incredible. If I were using a, a UHC filter, that would cut the star brightness a lot. So in comparison, the nebula would look a lot brighter. I'd really like to get a, a mono camera about this size, except they're, they're very expensive. But with a, with a mono camera and a narrow band filter, the, the nebula would really, really pop out. And it'd be really nice for hunting down faint galaxies. without the filter, just because you get almost a 3x bonus of sensitivity. Um, I'm not sure on the magnitude. So the, the individual exposures are only 8 seconds, but the total integration integrated time, I routinely go over 5 minutes. I know at the clubhouse, I don't remember if it was with this scope, or the four inch. I think it was during the winter. And one of the faintest stars I found in the image was like magnitude 18 or 19. It was pretty faint, but that was after maybe seven or 10 minutes of stacking. That's pretty good sort of structure to it. But you can see that what I suspect is partially reflection nebula. You can see it's slightly different color than the rest of it. There's a spot here and a big patch there. Let's see how it does on a open cluster. It might be pretty hard to find the open cluster against a background like that, just chock full of stars. I'll bring it back down to two seconds, apply a little bit of a stretch. Oh no, that's a fairly tight open cluster. It's all there. I don't think I need to stretch it as extremely. Well, it's a nice little one, fairly compact, a little sparse, but and I'll just kind of slowly keep this line, this bold line here is the meridian and it'll slowly march across. So as long as I this is kind of the best spot to be, as close to it as you can, because you're looking pretty nearly straight up. So a lot of times I'll just kind of hang out here and slowly hop from object to object and just keep slightly ahead of it. So let's check out M29. I think to get better star color, if I decrease the exposure a little more, not sure. I think it helps in the live stacking. There's a saturation slider that can be useful. See if we can see some of these dark nebula. 
I really like Dark Nebula. I think they're pretty neat. So with any luck, that should frame us right between the two of them. It might have been pretty hard to see on the chart because I think the, the font is just black on a black sky, not very useful. But I can definitely see that that one is there. There's just kind of a distinct lack of stars. And I think this one's a little larger and more diffuse, but when we start live stacking, it should be more apparent. So I just want to grab a name. So B344, B343. Now we'll start live stacking here. Clear out the crescent. Oh shoot, I don't think I saved a picture, but crescent's not going anywhere. It'll be there tomorrow night or the next year. So this one's definitely darker. I'm not sure about that other one. Maybe it's just a lot fainter. Or it could just be thinner. I find, especially with the dark nebula, it helps to sort of err on the brighter side. If you get too aggressive with the black point, you end up just clipping them into a black hole when you don't get any of the subtle variance and darkness. So it looks like it has a bit of a red cast, but it's hard to tell in Cygnus because there's there's a lot of hydrogen alpha regions around. <clears throat> Especially if you ever get a chance to look at it through a night vision device with a hydrogen alpha filter. It's absolutely incredible. So I think I'll leave the, the color balance a little red because more likely than not that is actual hydrogen alpha there. So the Tom's asking about the linearity of this chip. Um, I'm not sure. I know the CMOS tend to get a little funky toward the extremes, but I don't know how this one in particular performs. So far, I've only used it for tourism, just looking at stuff. Right now, there's a bit of a, a product void of a chip about this size that's mono that has all the newest CMOS technologies. My, our Sony just doesn't make a chip that fits the bill, so all the Astro camera manufacturers aren't really, at least the, the consumer ones, they're not really offering a a comparable mono chip to this one. I think the closest in size would be the ASI 1600, but it's a, a much older chip. With, doesn't have the high conversion gain, the super low read noise, the super high quantum efficiency, super deep wells. It's just sort of generally a little old, but perfectly functional. It's It would still show an image just as good as this one. It's just nice to have some of the newer features. So you can definitely see that little dark knot. The other one, 
It looks a little more sort of sprawled out and diffuse. Maybe a, a more aggressive stretch might show it. Yeah, maybe it's not so much one big, large, continuous thing, but a patchy area. Looks like there's kind of three or four dark regions. So I'll save that. Let's take a look at the crescent. So these are the two second exposures. With a little bit of a stretch, you can just barely make out the thin vertical wisp. So I'm gonna, now that we know that we're framed properly, I'll kick it up to eight seconds and start live stacking here. Oop, I hit the wrong button. Clear out the old one. Gonna relax that stretch just because it looks a little extreme. I forgot I'm doing double stretch again. But yeah, you can definitely see the blue and red color of it. Got four, four exposures, five exposures stacked, 40 seconds so far. So you can already start to make out some of the structure and color. And as it stacks more and more exposures, it'll just get cleaner and cleaner. And as it gets cleaner, then you can start to push the stretch a little more and make it show. Check the wide field, looks clear. And again, this would be another option where, or another object where even a UHC filter would help. It would really cut down on the background and star brightness. So in comparison, the nebula would pop out a lot more. The only trouble I found with at least my particular filter and my particular setup is I'd get uh, kind of a, a re reflection on the stars because at least the, the cheap UHC filter that I use is is a sort of thin film deposition interference type filter and it reflects all the rejected enter the wavelengths back out the way it came and with the Newtonian that means it just sends it back to the diagonal back to the primary and then that refocuses it back to the or some of it makes it back to the camera just a little bit so I get this kind of faint donut around 
my stars when I use the UHC filter. It's kind of annoying. But it, you know, it's a compromise and trade-off. If you need to see the emission nebula, it's a useful tool. It's just a lot of a lot of nights I've got a mixed observing list where I'll be looking at some galaxies and some nebula and kind of bouncing back and forth. It's always reminded me of uh, the two color 3D glasses. Looks like you're watching an old 3D movie without glasses. We'll see if I can be a little more aggressive with the histogram. Yeah, it looks like it's pushing it. There's a pretty faint area between the east and west called Pickering's Christmas tree or Pickering's Triangle or something. Let's see if we can get it. So we'll clear out the other one. Oh, I don't think I saved it. Oh well. I I, t I was looking at it last night, so I've got some captures. I'm glad you could tune in, Dan. It's, and there'll, there'll be a recording of this if you want to see the, the later parts another time. But it's been fun. I'd love to, to run this up at your house sometime. It could be fun. And the, the camera is 4K, so it could scale up to a 4k tv be pretty, pretty sweet <laughs> have a good night So this area is a lot fainter than the other one, so it might take a little while before it becomes very apparent. <clears throat> because if I try to push this one as hard as I was pushing the other one, I'll just be kind of exacerbating the noise. But you can definitely tell that something's there.
Gotta check up on them. Yeah, good thing I checked. The Meridian's sneaking up on us again. Uh, maybe we'll hop over to the Eastern Vale. So with this one, I might play around with the framing. So it's useful to go down to two seconds and apply a stretch. And then I've got a, uh, a virtual hand pad here. And I can maneuver the scope remotely. It's always a guessing game for me to tell which direction it's going to end up moving. That was the wrong choice. Or was it? I think I want to go the other way. So this is a, a pretty handy tool that just comes with ASCOM. It's called POTH, and it's a, uh, a hub. So you can run your mount through this. So a lot of mount drivers only allow one connection at a time. So what you do is you, you run that one connection to this hub, and then if you need your mount to talk to a planetarium, an auto-guiding thing, a plate-solving thing, all those other applications, you just have those talk to the hub and the hub handles you know it's almost like a little router it handles communication so the programs don't step on each other's feet i don't do any of that i just use it for this hand pad because my mounts driver doesn't have a hand pad so it looks like we're well framed so i'll crank it up to eight seconds there goes the satellite and i will Turn off the boost, start live stack, clear out the old one. Oh man, I've always, oh. an OLED screen, I've always wondered if they could just be like absolutely perfect for astrophotography with deep, deep velvety black blacks and just pinpoint searing stars. That'd be, that'd be awesome. I wish they weren't so expensive. And I wish they'd make an OLED monitor. For whatever reason, they don't make monitors. I think it has to do with the burn-in with a computer displaying a static image for a long time. But yeah, this, this section's much brighter. It builds pretty quick. Even though it's pretty noisy initially, you can still see sort of the overall structure. The finer details and texture is kind of lost in the noise, but as we accumulate frames, the noise should smooth out and the finer detail should become more apparent. So there, there is a hand pad in SharpCap. So SharpCap has a fantastic capability where you can, you can connect your mount to SharpCap and you can also plate solve, which is a huge game changer for a lot of people where you can uh, because it's you know, connected to the camera viewing the camera feed you can just send a picture to the plate solver and the plate solver compares it against star catalogs and index files and it it dead reckons and figures out exactly where the camera is looking and it with sharp cap you can have it automatically sync those coordinates to the mount and then have the mount re-slew so that it perfectly targets onto the object. 
The only problem is my uh, mounts driver and sharp cap don't play together for whatever reason. If I try to connect a scope, it just locks up, which is a bummer. Something I really want to figure out because I think in the next version of sharp cap, the author is focusing on automation tools. So there'll be like a, a little bit of a basic programming language built in. What I'd really like to do is to automate my initialization. So with like a single push of a button, it'd run through a script with an alt as mount and just sort of blind fire into six different locations in the sky, plate solve, sync, use that sync as an alignment point, and then just build an alignment model all by itself. Eventually, I want to put a motorized focuser on there so it can focus too. Just to cut down on the setup time, because right now, for me, that's the killer. And trying to use this for outreach is it, it takes me a good hour to do a thorough setup. I can do sort of a brief rushed setup in maybe 30 minutes, but it's still a long time to be there in the dark with people wanting to look. If I could get it down to 10 minutes would be awesome. So now that it's building a little bit and the noise is starting to fall off, we can see some of the finer lacy details in the veil. The, the evolution star sense combination looks pretty sweet. Just expensive. But time is money and it saves time. Any uh, object requests for the anything east of the meridian? Let's see. Not sure if uh, Andromeda might be clearing the trees, sort of maybe 45 degree horizon approximately. So Bruce is asking about the integration length. Right now, this is about five minutes. So I'm, I'm using eight second exposures and they're getting aligned and stacked live in real time and averaged together. And then you can apply a, a histogram stretch that's sort of live and reactive. So it, it really simplifies the process and gets it going pretty quick. And because the, the individual exposures are so short, it's extremely forgiving for the mount. Like uh, my mount is almost comical it's a it's a 15 pound rated super polaris with a 25 pound scope and a gym weight stuck to it on a surveyor's tripod it's kind of like a frankenstein thing but it it works just fine for eaa and even an alt azimuth mount would work which is I think my next adventure will be an Altaz mount. Last fall, I got a, a really cheap 12-inch F4 imaging Newtonian. The only problem is it weighs 57 pounds, and it, it might be a little bit too much for my Super Polaris, so I have to come up with another mounting solution for it. So I, right now I'm using 8 seconds, but it... it 
could probably also do four. Four would probably work too. And if, if we look at the individual exposures, sort of without the, the live stack, you can you can make out the object. So this is this is just a four second exposure and a two second exposure. I think the the big thing that allows you to do this is the combination of extremely low read noise, so there's almost no penalty in taking an exposure, a very fast telescope. This is a F4 Newtonian, and then as large of a pixel as you can find. This For a CMOS, this camera has pretty medium pixels, of, I think 4.63 micron. But the, the sort of trifecta of having low read noise, fast scope, medium to large size pixels lets you get away with really, really short sub exposures at almost no penalty because because you are overwhelming the read noise and the, the noise gets added in quadrature. So when you add the shot noise of the short sub and the tiny read noise, that tiny read noise almost becomes insignificant compared to the shot noise. So it effectively becomes unimportant so you can get these really really short exposures which is a lot of fun and it sort of greatly reduces the barrier to entry so you can use a really cheap mount you don't need auto guiding like if we look at uh, let's see for a second let's start right now my dark frame is mismatched so it will probably be some hot pixels but shouldn't be too bad but if we watch the drift graph here, this will report the offsets that SharpCap is applying to the pictures as they roll in. And if, if we were to watch this on like a 10 or 15 minute long integration, you'd, with my mount, you'd see it sort of meandering back and forth like an S. My periodic error is pretty bad. I think it's something like 40 pixels which might work out to almost an arc minute. Oops, sorry, I wasn't paying attention to the histogram. So this is a four second live stack. And I accidentally have a double stretch. There we go. So even with four seconds, you can make it work and and four seconds should should be more than short enough for an alt azimuth so the individual sub exposures wouldn't have any field rotation and sharp cap when it does its alignment it also does rotation so the stacking process will counter the rotation the only issue is you'll get little black triangles that appear in the corners but it's not too big of a deal usually you're at least for EAA, it's kind of about the object in the middle. And I, it's kind of a, the price to pay. You accept those little aberrations on the corner just to be able to, to play. I've had some clouds come and go. Earlier, I had a bank of clouds kind of come from the south, roll through to the north. So earlier tonight I did a dark nebula. I just saw it reading through the comments here. Uh, we could probably go for another one. It's probably about time to relocate because the meridian's sneaking up on us. Here, how about this one? E358. Not too sure. Don't know what it. So this is a sight unseen for me. I don't know. Yeah, I think there's definitely a dark nebula there. A little protrusion. Looks like there's a large cloud bank off to the side, but there might be a little sort of peninsula of it jutting out. 
So we'll bump up the exposure. We're going to stop this stretch, switch to live stack, clear out the old stack once it comes up. There we go. Clear out the veil, and now we'll start stacking on a dark nebula. Let's see. B358. Go to the histogram. Not 100% sure, but I think the one we're looking for is right in there, or it could be this large area, and the scope's just a little off. Let's check. So at least looking at the number of stars, I can actually crank it up here. With cart to seal you can actually add the Gaia data dumps. So you can just have a ludicrous amount of stars active. So you can turn it up to the point where you can actually see Dark Nebula in the planetarium, not by the icon, but by the actual lack of stars. And you can see open clusters and stuff. That's pretty cool. So uh, right now, the, since we did the Meridian flip, the camera is flipped 180. So if I flip the planetarium, you can see that the view is pretty similar. We're looking at the right spot. So you can see that large dark bank and then the smaller dark clump. So that's, that's what we're seeing here, that large dark bank and the small clump. I'm going to turn the stars down before my computer lights on fire. And then we can hop around and look at some other dark nebula. Let's try B355. It's a smaller one. We'll see if it's any more uh, concentrated or not. Ooh. Nice hydrogen alpha emission. I know Cygnus is just chock full of hydrogen alpha. Looks like that's the tip of Mexico and the North American Nebula. And since we're here, I'll definitely try for a, there's a Herbig Harrow object in the Pelican that I always like to try for. So far I haven't had a, a decisive detection of it, but it's something I've always wanted to see. If I ever get the 12 inch F4 up and running, that's definitely something I want to try with it. I think they call this the wall, North America wall. It's kind of the brightest, more, most detailed area. <clears throat> I could reframe it just so we can see it. Let's see, we'll pause the live stack, go to two seconds, just for a quick refresh. We'll apply a little stretch, and now we'll open the hand pad. Just move the scope and stop it when we're happy.
And that dark nebula is right there, so I don't want it to go too, too far. I'd still like to keep that in frame. It looks like we still got it. So go back to the live stack, up it back to 8 seconds. Stop that double stretch. Clear the old stack out of memory. And now we should start a restacking, but with a different framing, just so we can see more of the North America. So I haven't done any asteroids with this scope and camera combo, but I think I did one with the four and a half inch, where uh, usually what I'll, at least with sharp cap, what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll set it up to do live stacking, but there's a setting where you can save the live stack every two minutes or three minutes. And that way you, you build up a nice, you know, low noise image, but then you it automatically saves it off at a, you know, consistent interval. So you end up with a, a folder full of pretty nice low noise images. That's a good time sequence. And then I, I use uh, either, I think, Registrax or Image J to align the stars because the, the live stacking will align all my sub exposures so that all the stars line up but because with that setting the live stack resets the first picture to come in is kind of the baseline so over time the frame kind of oscillates around with my periodic error so i end up having to align all of those little mini live stacks and then i can bring it into blender which is like a 3D modeling software, but it also has animation software in it. And you can set up a sequence of uh, pictures and animate it at a certain frame rate and resolution and then publish to YouTube, which is fun. That's how I did the Comet videos that I had. I set up the camera to do one minute or four minute live stacks and then animated those frames. Although that time it was easier because I wasn't tracking the was stationary tripod and I let the stars streak by, so I didn't have to do any alignment. But in just under four minutes, it's looking decent. You can see a lot of detail and texture. It looks like a little dark nebula there. A lot of sort of rim lighting on that. Like a little reflection nebula in there. You can see there's a little black spot. Uh, that's probably just a hot pixel. And then the dark frame is subtract over subtracting it. It's not perfect, but good enough. So for for scripting, currently, you, 
I mean, I, th I think there's a, in the pro version of SharpCap, there's a scripting aspect that gives you like a little API. And then as long as you can co code, you know, the sky's the limits. But in a future version of SharpCap, I think he's going to include like a, a visual block based, functional block based programming language. And then you can automate routines using that. But for, for EAA, I, I like to drive it. It's, most of the fun for me is seeing the stuff as it's coming in. It's kind of a, for me, it's a method of observing, just using the camera instead of an eyepiece. So to, to automate a live stacking routine kind of defeats the purpose for me. But you could definitely automate a conventional process using longer exposures. Or, or if you're interested in data reduction so that you don't end up with, you know, tens of gigabytes the next morning and you just have the, you know, single condensed image like live stacking produces, that might be valuable. Let's see if we can get to the pelican. So it's right at the back of the head, I think. If if, from our view, the pelican's kind of upside down. There's its eye, there's its beak. But at the back of the head, there's a really bright wall. And out of that wall, there's a very long, slender, dark, silhouette of dust and at the very end of that long slender trunk there should be a like a a jet that's shot out of a protostar that's forming in that dark nebula which is really cool but it's like for this camera this telescope it's just at the threshold of resolution so i've never really had you know confident uh observation of it. It looks like we're framed well enough. So you, I can just barely make it out in the noise. It's very noisy right now because it's only one or two frames and I've got a pretty aggressive stretch applied to it. But I can back off, ease up on the stretch for now because we don't have a lot of data. I don't know. I can just barely make out that dark trunk. It's not looking super great. Pretty murky. But uh, eventually when it fills out, there'll be a long, slender, dark trunk. And at the very end of it, there would be a very small sort of streak of light, which is kind of the bow shock of this high energy jet of particles that are just flung out of the center or axis of rotation of this forming protostar. And the it goes almost to those two stars and then almost in equal length the other direction but I don't know if we'll see it tonight this is pretty looking pretty rough as it is not very clear
even under fantastic uh, conditions, this is still like threshold detectable. But I, I just think it's incredible to be able to see, you know, direct evidence of stellar birth in the obscure clouds of dust as they kind of collapse and condense and pull all that material in. So cool. It's always really cool to see the uh, infrared imagery where it can peer through some of the obscuring gas and dust. And you can see all the protostars in there. Yeah, I don't think this will end up looking great. Or it would take a very long time to do. Which is probably better objects to look at in that time. Let's see what this is. Not sure how bright this will be. Nice. That should look pretty good with a live stack. It's a lot brighter than that pelican thing we we're looking at. Should be a lot quicker to build. Yeah, I keep forgetting to turn off the double stretch. This is NGC 7023. Something tells me I'm going to want to save this one. So I'm going to restart the stack just so that the name gets applied. It's a just a weird quirk with the newest version of SharpCap. Didn't used to be that way. You could just rename it while it was running. And this is pretty much on the Meridian right now, so we won't have a ton of time to stack it. I think my mount will go seven degrees over. Definitely tell it's sort of really heavily shrouded by a dark nebula.
Oh, looks like we got some cloud. Yep, yeah, there's some clouds. So this would be a good application of the brightness filter in SharpCap. So I, I could uh, turn on this filter that just basically you set up a threshold that if a picture is brighter than that threshold, it does not get applied to the stack. So I wasn't using it, so the stack's getting washed out. But that's all right, because this is pretty close to the meridian, and we should probably move east. Looks like we've got a. We'll be in the clouds, so we'll see how the live stack goes. Clear out the old object. The mount's been doing pretty good as far as landing on center. And with the clouds, it'll be pretty murky. It'll be pretty hard to pull anything out of it. But with a wide field camera, we can keep tabs on it and restart the stack when the clouds blow by. If they blow by. I don't know if it's a big bank or not. I love having this wide field camera. You know, with the live stacking, there's no real need for a guider just because the exposures are so short and the software takes care of the alignment. So it's nice to give the second camera another purpose. And especially operating remotely, not being out there, being able to see see what's actually going on. It's nice to, to have that kind of ties you back into the remote scope. Looks like we got an opening coming up just a little bit, so we'll clear the live stack as soon as this patch goes. And I'm sure there'll be another bank not too far behind, but it might give us, I don't know, a minute and a half. Clear it, Let's see what happens. Still pretty murky. Maybe I'll do one more clear just to get rid of the last little residual. So it'll have to be pretty quick. I mean, I guess I could try the brightness filter.
pause the live stack. I think we could try for the bubble, depending if the clouds will cooperate. It's not looking good. Let's see how uh, 31 looks. As far as clouds go, that's better. Maybe the heart might be clear, or it could be in the house. Yeah, not quite high enough. Pac-Man, really giving the motors a workout. Is that an opening or just a, yeah, we'll see. If the banks of clouds just keep coming in, that might be the end of it. But we'll give this a shot, all that opening's coming up. like pea soup. It's starting to clear. I don't see anything there, but we'll just start live stacking in good faith. So far, the mount's been pretty good about landing on target. So, yeah, there's definitely something there.
So uh, when I pause, as, as long as when I resume, enough of the field of view still overlaps, it should resume all right. Even if it was, you know, half of the way displaced over, it, it could probably resume after that. But with my periodic error in my right ascension, it's only, you know, maybe a 20th of, of the field of view, it's just a very gentle side to side rocking. So even after a long pause, it, it would probably resume okay. Maybe I will try brightness filtering. Let's see how that goes. It looks patchy, like a, some thin clouds still there. But we can definitely see the object. Go to histogram, automatic color balance. Just because the clouds really throw it, throw it off. And I forgot to enter the name on this one. This was IC five one four six. It looks like there's a bit of a, not quite a dark nebula, but there's definitely some opaque gas and dust. It doesn't completely cut out all the stars, but it looks like it kind of surrounds the area and extends that way a little bit. And then this star just happens to be in the middle, lighting it up. Maybe a little reflection nebula there too. Hard to tell with the hazy clouds, it could just be scatter.
Yeah, see if the bubble cleared up. Looks like the clouds are momentarily cooperating. That should be all right. I want to check the framing on this one. I'd like to get M52 in there too. That's pretty good. I'll adjust it a little bit. So I'll exit the live stack. I'll be looking at the, the raw frames coming from the camera. And I'll bring up the POTH hand pad. From here I can manually adjust the telescope. There we go. Even in the these little two second exposures you can just about make out the bubble. You can definitely see M fifty two. Looks like it has a single bright member. I don't know if that's a foreground star or if it's actually a member of the cluster. So let's crank up the exposure to eight seconds. And for kicks we'll see what the individual frames look like. You can just just make out half of the bubble. There we go. I just cleared out the old live stack, and now we're starting a new live stack on the bubble. Just double check for clouds. Looks like some thin stuff coming in but who knows, there could be another bank behind it. And I've got the histogram sort of way too cranked. And I also have two stretches going on, which is never good. But you can definitely see some hydrogen alpha sort of red glow there. Looks a little blue, so I'll adjust the color over here. see Bruce's comment it always works out that way as soon as you pack up it clears up but it looks like it's pretty patchy still like there's just banks coming and going so I don't know how much longer I'll go for either but thanks for tuning in Bruce I remember when I was shooting Neowise I I brought my this setup with me. I wanted to do a time lapse, really zoomed in on the core. And I uh, went through the whole setup, got it up and running, initialized, aligned, dark frame, flat frame, everything ready to go. And a big bank of clouds rolled in and it just kept rolling in for an hour, two hours. And then I finally decided to pack it up. And as soon as I broke down the tripod, put it in the car. There's a clearing on the horizon and it just cleared up. But that's all right. I still got to see Neo eyes. It was worth it. Oh, 
the bubble's looking pretty good. You can definitely see more of it. Not quite fully circular. Maybe uh, two-thirds. So this is new to me. I, this is the first time I've actually used it, but it looks like the brightness filter is doing its job. Looks like there were a couple clouds going by and it rejected those frames. I, I saw your comment, Tom. I could, I could definitely help you, sort of, set up or advise on component choices and stuff. I know you have the the twelve inch or the eleven inch Cassegrain with the Hyperstar, and that that would be a killer EAA short exposure telescope. The uh, the the effect of read noise, camera speed or telescope speed and uh, pixel size, they're all squared terms. So even small improvements to either of them can lead to big performance gains. And going from this telescope's at f4 and to go to f2 with a hyperstar, it'd be really, really nice. And if you could even put it onto some kind of alt azimuth mount and just have something that you could plop down, no polar alignment, have some kind of plate solve alignment so it kind of starts itself, make it as easy to just turn on. Because I, I really love doing this, but the setup time is like an hour. And a lot of times there's short nights where, you know, clouds forecast to come in or it's a work night and I. I just don't feel like setting up, but I would like to live stack, so sometimes I miss some nights just because of the, the large setup time. So currently, most of my efforts are on reducing that setup time. I want to try and make it as quick and easy as possible. The only trouble is they don't make a lot of nice big altazes for big scopes. Or at least go to Altazes. I know there's the AZ EQ5, but I don't know how big that goes up to. That's the problem I'm facing with my 12-inch uh, F4. That thing weighs 57 pounds, so I'm going to end up building a Dobsonian base for it and then motorize it with OnStep. Because even if I had a German Equatorial that was big enough for it, I don't think I'd want to lift that over my shoulders to get it into the saddle, hold it with one hand to tighten the saddle bolts every night that I set up. If I, if I have second thoughts about setting up my little 8-inch, I know I'd have, I'd rarely ever use a 12-inch if I had to put it on an equatorial. A lot of people on the um, Cloudy Nights EAA form use the uh, 
Celestron Evolution mounts with the SCTs, and they're really nice. I just don't know if they go up to 11 inch or not. I, I don't think they do. But even if it was like borderline marginal, as long as you're using a hyperstar with a camera on the front, the exposures would be so short that even if it was, you know, meagerly tracking, it'd probably be just fine. But to have the star sense auto align would be pretty awesome. But my, my plan for my 12 inches, I'm going to make a mount. I've got, uh, actually just today, the pile of bearings showed up. So I'm going to do a big cast aluminum hub axis and try and 3D print a worm gear and have stepper motors go to it. I think the printed gear should be accurate enough for EAA, especially in large diameters where the the uh, inaccuracies, you know, become less important with a larger diameter or they have less effect on the arc second tracking. CPC, yeah, CPCs are pretty cool too. Yeah, but the bubble's looking pretty nice. It's probably uh, accumulated enough data that I could push the stretch a little more. That cluster's looking pretty full too. Sky's a little green, so I can adjust the color. Now it's a little purple. Be nice if they had a uh, a box select color balance where you could just select some sky and it would just set it to gray. See if Andromeda is clear. Oh, I just think it'd be really fun to bring this to outreach to be able to show people. Looks like it's a little murky where Andromeda is. But to be able to kind of show this on screen and be able to point out the details to a group so they can all see the same thing. So we got uh, M32 and M10 or 110. Can never keep them straight. So the closer, brighter one is M32, the farther, fainter one is 110. I think the uh, the Rosses are very very optimized for EAA, or they they would be the holy grail ideal telescope for short exposure past EAA. The only trick is the 
the very short focal length. If you're looking to hunt down very small, faint objects, then the resolution becomes a little tricky. So you either need a very small pixeled camera, which starts to degrade the benefits of the speed. Because ideally, if, if uh, size and money wasn't, oop, looks like the clouds are moving in. It looks like I'm just viewing the raw frame, so I'm not really losing anything. I think ideally you'd be able to have a fast telescope with very large pixels, but also very good image scale, but that results in a monster telescope. So using the Rasa with like a smaller pixel camera would probably be pretty good. I think it is supposed to have better correction across the field, corner to corner for larger sensors than a hyperstar. A lot of people that do EAA really like the Schmidt Cassegrains versus the Rasa just because it's so flexible where you can choose to use a hyperstar on it and put the camera on the front or you could choose to put the secondary mirror in and use a f6.3 reducer or the star zone or night owl f4 reducer or f10 for really tiny objects but eaa at f10 gets a little slow and you could use it visually too if you ever wanted to for lunar or planetary whereas the rasa it's kind of a, a thoroughbred machine for short exposure and just a light funnel for funneling photons into pixels Looks like we're still eh, squaring out. So crank it up to eight seconds and start a live stack. Clear out the bubble. There's a, an accessory for the Newtonians that I've been looking out for on the used market. They don't show up very often, but there's a, a combination focal reducer and coma corrector that takes it down to 0 0.75 or 0.73. So it would take my F4 Newtonian and take it down to F2.8, which would be a, a huge gain. The only problem is those things are like 800 to 900 dollars new so i've been hoping to see one pop up used i guess they are sort of infamously nightmarish when it comes to collimation and tip tilt in the optical train and a lot of people end up pulling their hair out trying to use the things so I'm hoping to scoop one up that someone is selling out of frustration someday. It's just they don't pop up often. Hey, Venu. Good to see you. Glad you could tune in. Have a good one. I'm going to take a look out the window just to see if it's uniformly hazy or not. Because the wide field camera is good at catching clouds, but the camera is also powerful enough to penetrate through a thin haze.
so it doesn't show up as easily. It just feels like the the live stacking is struggling a little more than it usually does. It's a little slower to build up and it's a little grittier. But even still it's got fantastic details. You can see all the sort of dust lanes and fine detailed filaments and stuff. It's great. <laughs> Collision course. Be fun to sit down one day with a really good uh, Andromeda observing guide and kind of hunt down all the really faint emission nebula in the dust lanes and all the globular clusters. I know there's almost like a, a hundred, hundred of them or a couple hundred of them that you can find. At this image scale, they look pretty much just like stars, but as long as you have a star chart to go off of, you could probably find them. I'd, I'd definitely love to do a, a virtual EAA-based star party. I think it'd be good to sort of coordinate and have kind of a tag team where I could I can run the system and then have someone knowledgeable sort of handle the crowd and the discussion of the objects and stuff. I think I think that kind of format could go pretty well. Looks like there's a little spot of hydrogen alpha there. Or maybe that's one of the globulars. It's pretty noticeably orange. Now I wonder if Cartesil has the globulars in there. So it looks like a horizontal band of bright stars. Let me check the orientation. That's the other way. So we'll flip the planetarium. And I think I'm looking on this horizontal band of bright stars. And I think it's that one in particular that looks curious. And on the star chart, I think that is right over here. So there's the almost look to me, it looks like a balloon animal dog. You got the two legs and the head. And over here you got the two legs and the head. Right about there. Well, shows up as a star in the Gaia catalog, so probably not a glob. Although I wonder if there's a Cartesial catalog for it. See. Looks like this is just for globulars in the Milky Way, so I don't think it'll come up. Yeah. I know Stellarium has some of the Andromeda globular clusters and uh, Sky Safari too. But at this point, it's probably accumulated enough data that we can stretch it a little 
harder. Now you can start to see some of the blue sort of intense star forming regions on the far side. tone it down a little bit just because I'm starting to show the noise. Yeah, maybe I'm just not good at making balloon animal dogs if that's the way my balloon animal dogs look. Just be glad I didn't make up the constellations. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see if M30. Excuse me. We'll see if M33 is clear of the trees. That one's one of my favorites, especially with this scope and camera camera combination. It's, you can just sort of pan around and zoom into all the little nebula. Just gonna nudge it toward the center a little bit. Bump it up to eight seconds. Clear out the old live stack. You can just see the, the haze up there. But you can also, I think you can, it might be Andromeda in the finder scope, that little smudge. And already, even though it's pretty noisy and there's only 40 seconds of data, you can already start to see some of the, I can only imagine, enormous uh, emission nebula all throughout M33. Take a look out the window.
Doesn't look terrible, but doesn't look great either. Any last requests for uh, targets? I might wrap it up pretty soon otherwise. I think it might be in the trees, but we could try for Pluto. Yeah, I think the, the foreground, the most of the stars are foreground, except for maybe some of the absolute faintest ones here. Yeah, I think it's definitely hazier than it was yesterday. For comparison, this is, uh, so we've been running this stack for almost five minutes. And this one is almost three minutes. And it was sort of much cleaner and nicer than the one we have now. So I think there's a little bit of haze working against us. Now let's try for Pluto. I, I think it might be in the trees though, so we'll give it a shot. It's a gamble. And there goes the window. Shine my flashlight into it. No, it doesn't look like it. Maybe, maybe an hour ago, two hours ago, it might have been clear in the little notch. This is why whenever I do anything planetary, I end up going to that athletic field in Sudbury, just because it has better horizons. My horizons here are pretty bad. They're like, I don't know, almost 45 degrees plus or minus 10 degrees all the way around. This might be high enough though. It's a consolation prize. Ugh. <sighs> 
that's in the other tree. <laughs> Dang it. I hope that one, that one's high enough. There you go, a little globular. One last peek at uh, the dumbbell, and I think that'll be the last one. I'll wrap up. So, well, thanks for tuning in. It's fun. Yeah. It's always nice without mosquitoes, too. And in the winter, it's nice not to freeze. But it's also nice to be out under the stars sometimes, visual. I think I'm going to shut it down and sign off. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Have a good one. Have clear skies.